Okay, this is discrete mathematics. We're talking in module three, we're going to talk about methods of proving uh, topics. And in particular, we're going to look at direct proofs in module three. In module four, we will start working with indirect proofs. And later on, we'll, we'll work with proofs by induction and other types of proofs. So this first video, uh, we're gonna talk about what is a proof. And there's a little cartoon over here that I like. Um, well, so that, that brings up the question, what really is a proof? Well, they're a complex argument, but what does that mean? In fact, proofs are a story. They're a story, um, a story that leads the reader by the hand, um, taking them directly, and most importantly, inevitably to the desired conclusion. I like the analogy of this maze. So imagine you're leading somebody through a maze and you say, okay, now we're gonna go straight. Now we have to turn right. Why? Why do we turn right? You need to give an answer. Then we turn left. Why do we do that? Give me an answer. Now we go to the left again. Why do we do that? So each step, you want to think, as you're writing a proof, you want to think you have an audience. Just like writing a work of fiction, you have an audience, and you need to clearly justify each and every step. So imagine your audience says, why, why, why? Every time you do anything, you have to give a justification for everything you do to make it so that from the beginning of the proof to the end of the proof, there is no other way around it, if that makes sense. So a good proof should be easy to follow. And I really like the story analogy. Um, a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end, so does a proof. A story takes you through, um, takes you through the idea of the author, and you see what the author was thinking in the in the story. Um, same with the proof. A proof uh, needs to be clear. It needs to justify each step. You need to never leave an open spot in your logic where somebody, uh, where you haven't answered the why question, right? You never want to do something and not fully explain and justify it. Um, as such, your proofs are going to have a lot of English in them, right? These are not just mathematics, nor should they be. A proofs are a story. So let's see some more about this. So, as we said before, proof is a carefully reasoned argument or story that convinces a skeptical reader that a given statement is true, right? This reader, you want to assume is skeptical. That's the why, why, why part. They're going to ask every step, why? Why can you do that? Why can you do that? Why did you do this? And you need to have an answer. Um, a theorem, once you've proved something, we call it a theorem, right? So a statement that's already been proved true is known as a theorem. And once it's been proved, we don't need to keep proving it. Once it's been proved, we can use it. And when we use it, we call them a theorem. 
And another term that doesn't crop up a lot in this class, but you might hear, is lemma. A lemma is like a baby proof. So if you're trying to prove that A implies C, for example, if this is your goal, you might show, you might have a lemma that shows that A implies B, and another lemma that shows that B implies C, and then you can use those two lemmas to conclude your actual goal. Right? So a lemma is like a baby proof or a small one part of a larger proof. Some proofs are easier than others. Right? So this is an easy proof. We're going to do this later in a later video. We're going to prove that uh, 4RS is even for any and all integers r and s. That's a fairly easy proof. Here's a harder proof. It might not look crazy hard at first, but it's um, a to the n plus b to the n equals c to the n, and that the fact that no three positive integers can satisfy it unless for any n greater than 2. Um, does anybody recall what it's called when n equals 2? This is Pythagorean's theorem. And you've probably used it a bunch before in geometry and algebra. But if the numbers get bigger than 2, it turns out there are no whole number solutions for this. And this was first um, described by a mathematician named Pierre de Fermé. in 1637 and what happened was is he scribbled in the margin of a book that he was reading and he said I have discovered a truly marvelous proof of this proposition that this margin is too narrow to contain and then he died um, this became known as Fermat's last theorem And for literally hundreds of years, people tried to solve it. It was eventually solved fairly recently in 1994 by a guy named Andrew Wiles. And that was after 358 years of mathematicians trying to solve it. So that tells you something about how difficult this is. It took more than 350 years to be solved. Um, I'm going to post a, a link to a video that goes into a little bit more detail in that story because I think that's, um, that's a great story in mathematics. Okay, so you should already be familiar with a couple of these techniques because we did them in, previous, in the previous module. Um, how do we prove an existential statement true? Right, if I say there exists a purple dog, how do I prove it true? Well, you have to find an example. Right. Proving an existential statement false, how do I prove that there are no purple dogs? I have to do a proof by exhaustion. Which would be difficult with dogs, but with numbers, if you have a finite domain, you can do a proof by exhaustion by looking through every element in the domain and showing that the existential statement does not work for it. 
Similarly, we talked about proving a universal statement true. Um, to do that, again, if I want to say that all college students are human. Well, to really prove that, I have to do a proof by exhaustion. I have to go to every single college student or every single element of my domain and demonstrate that the property is true. To prove a universal statement false, all I have to do is find a counterexample. And it turns out, I read a article recently about a service dog was granted a college degree because he was there for every step of the way of his human's college experience. And so this would be an example, a counterexample, to the statement that all college students are human. So what we're going to do is, in future videos, we're going to look at some ways of proving things other than these four. But these are still very valid proof techniques, and you need to know these and be comfortable with them. All right, but now we're going to work on seeing um, some new techniques.